with a, a sunny and warm day uh, in Orlando when you got a pool and a pool bar out there. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Moore, and I'm president of Moore & Associates, and uh, uh, I've done this presentation and workshop on, uh, on packaging, sustainable packaging together with uh, Susan Cornish of Insight and in Action. And I'm going to move the podium over to her to uh, give a little outline of her company, and then we'll, uh, we'll launch right into it. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for making it out. We actually did a much earlier version of this presentation at the first CERC after the pandemic, well, really, into the pandemic, August 21. Uh, and uh, it was a much smaller conference that year, so we're looking forward to you uh, seeing a lot more people. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along. This is just a uh, workshop. And we want to be uh, interactive. So let's uh, take a quick look uh, at Insight in Action. We do consumer research, consumer insights. Uh, we do B2B interviews and surveys. We do sustainable packaging, research and consulting, and recycling market analysis uh, for recycled markets. Let me, while people are Coming in, we're going to have Bill do a quick show and tell. So what I say when you, you know, when you're in grammar school, frequently your day started out with show and tell. So we uh, do show and tell with some uh, horror packaging stories. And uh, uh, usually we were looking like a month or two in advance of what comes in our doors uh, uh, in packaging. But we got a late start this year and uh, only took uh, uh, about two weeks worth. So. Uh, so here's, here's my number one item. Can, uh, who can tell me what's, what's not so good about this package in terms of recycling? Foil. foil. Yeah, it's foil. It's great SPS, uh, high quality fiber uh, uh, that high, high end packaging is done with. But when the marketing people overlay it with foil and we've got to recycle it and the mills have to use it, then they're not real happy with that. Uh, by the way, there's a new ISRI proposed spec to cover all SBS packaging and polycoated, uh, and that's something you'll probably be hearing more about uh, going forward. So, not to be totally uh, a paper related, uh, I, I brought this plastic foam uh, padded mailer that came. So, what's what's wrong with this one? Uh, no, it's not paper. It's all. It's actually all film. But what's wrong with the film? Black. It's black. And it's got actually foil layer in it. So it, the plastics people wouldn't be really happy to get that back. Not that any curbside program uh, or any residential program handles uh, uh, padded mailers. And of course, so some of the worst ones are the uh, craft brown paper with bubble wrap inside of them. But luckily, we've got a new generation of uh, paper padded mailers that uh, are growing. And we're seeing more and more of those. And, and those are completely recyclable with OCC. So how about this package? This is the inside of the package, but this is the outside. What's the story with this one? It's the black coating. I mean, uh, you know, do you really need a black coating on the outside of something that's very recyclable, and yet when a mill has to handle this, there's going to be a lot of loss getting that black off. And you know what it is is uh, throughout the history of packaging, the marketing people, you know, packaging serves two purposes, safety, protect the material, move the material, and get it sold. And people are starting to think the marketing aspects of it uh, uh, because of the sustainability and recycling aspects. And so this one's just a kind of garden variety bubble wrap one. Again, uh, you know, they proliferated. When people talked about big corrugated boxes showing up from uh, e-tailers, uh, the e-tailers countered with, well, we'll ship them in uh, uh, in film mailers, they'll take up less space. What's, what's wrong with this one? It's too small. Anything smaller than three inches is probably going to wind up in residue in the MRF. Uh, the good news is that uh, I'm seeing a, a real move in hotels to get away from these and go to uh, canister refillables, which serve a couple purposes. Uh, you only use what, uh, what you want, and uh, it's, a, it's a bigger package uh, when they're done with it. The, the other thing I saw in a hotel I stayed in a couple weeks ago was uh, 
uh, a, the soap recycling program, used soap recycling, and uh, uh, I, I, it was written up a while back about what they do with this. They clean it up and process it. And uh, uh, the other thing is that there's actually a group of companies that have come together uh, in a coalition which includes L'Oreal and P&G and other uh, uh, personal care products uh, to uh, build recyclability into small packages. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. So my, my last horror one is, uh, is, is, is this one. So, you know, this is, uh, this is du uh, dunnage or uh, cushioning in, uh, in packaging. And, you know, we used to see a lot of polystyrene pe peanuts. We don't see many of those anymore. Uh, unless you're getting shipments directly from Asia, you still see those. But what, what's, what's wrong with this when it gets to the household? It's shredded, so you're going to get, you're going to lose it. Uh, and even if you didn't lose it, it's beater dyed red. And, you know, Beater dyed red, uh, you know, if you're going into a blackboard, I guess that would be okay. But in a lot of applications, if you have too much of it, it's going to give you problems. So those are my, my horror stories for, for today on packaging, and I'll, I'll pass it back to Susan to, uh, to keep it moving. Thank you, Bill. When we started this look at packaging, we asked, what are the biggest trends that are impacting changing packaging? And where we end up at the end of the presentation is recycling and paper packaging specifically. And so what do we need to look at in terms of recycling and recyclability as packaging changes? The three big trends that have impacted packaging are the pandemic, obviously the growth of e-commerce, which accompanied the pandemic, a growing focus on sustainability among brand owners, and changing consumer attitudes towards sustainability. So for example, with brand owners, if we take a look at the top five, these are the largest five consumer packaged goods company. Companies, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Pepsi, Unilever, and Anheuser-Busch. Uh, of the top 25, 80% of them are, sorry, 100% of them are uh, looking to increase recycled content, minimize packaging, and introduce reusable packaging. Eight out of 10 of them are working towards fully recyclable packaging. And you can see, just looking down the list here, recyclable, reusable, we've got some compostable, and when we get to Anheuser-Busch beverages, they're looking at packaging that's also returnable. And also, all within 2025, 2030 deadlines. So brand owners are com committing in a significant way, and almost daily we see reports uh, in the media. Now, what about consumers? I've got a few slides here on consumers. This is a study that I did in, with uh, gen primary grocery shoppers, just an average of US households. And I did it in early 2020, and again in 2022, in January. And we have 11, uh, attributes that are relating to sustainable packaging, environmentally friendly types of packaging, uh, attitudes, and we ask people about agreement on a five-point scale. You can see that uh, eight out of 10 agreed with companies should be replacing plastic packaging with environmentally friendly materials, uh, followed by paper or cardboard is better for the environment. Uh, the things that people agreed with less, down at the bottom of the list here, are I look for information on recyclability. I consider myself to be an environmentally aware consumer. Less agreement with some of these. And what stands out is three of the top four are things that companies should be doing. At the bottom are the personal responsibility. I try to buy packaging. I consider myself to be aware and I do research. So consumers are looking for companies and com companies are committing to greater sustainability. Now, don't be alarmed at this chart. On the left, we've got, uh, this is a study done by McKinsey. And uh, on the left, we've got 10 or 11 packaging substrates. They went out and did a global study, asked 10 consumers in 10 different countries, what's more sustainable, what's less sustainable? So if consumers perceived it to be more sustainable, there's a blue dot that's eight, nine, or 10 on a 10 point scale. If consumers perceived it to be less sustainable, that's 
zero or one, two, three on a 10 point scale, it's a black dot. So you can see that there's a fair bit of consistency across countries on paper based, uh, paper based packaging is sustainable, glass bottles and jars are sustainable. And at the bottom, most people know that packaging that combines different materials is not very recyclable, and aluminum foil wraps, not very recyclable. Uh, so there is a fair bit of consistency across countries on what people think is sustainable in a package. So that's good. We have a sense that people know what they're talking about when sustainability is raised as an issue. Now, the chart that I showed was attitudes. How do people feel about, do they agree with sustainable attitudes? What do they actually do when they get to the store? This is a study done by Ipsos, a big consumer research company, and they asked people uh, what motivates them when they make a purchase. We've got price and availability as 83, 77, 71%. Um, those things matter the most to most, most people. When we get to how sustainable the product is, we've got 22% for a, rating at four or five on a five point scale. And so consumers are agreeing with sustainable attitudes, but let's take a bit closer look at what they're actually doing. In my study, I asked people, would you pay more for packaging made with recycled materials, packaging that can be recycled, packaging that's compostable, et cetera, Basically, between 35 and 40% said, no, I won't pay more for any of that. But we do have about 20%, 15 to 20, that say they'll pay a lot more. And the rest are in the middle. What was interesting was between 2020 and 2022, this is would not pay more. The percentage who would not pay more in 2020 was a lot higher than in 2022. So those sustainability, agreement with sustainability attributes went way up as did the number that would pay, would not pay more and went way down, or significantly down. Um, this is more research by Ipsos. If we ask people to trade off, what would you be willing to trade off to get buy a package that's more sustainable? People will trade off, they'll say, well, I don't mind new or different packaging, and I don't mind new or different ingredients, that's fine. But not as acceptable is products that are not available, uh, different performance from the product, or higher prices. And finally, I found this segmentation done by Ipsos, which segmented the population, and this was done last fall, last October, into groups based on answers about sustainability. And so we see that the activists are about 15% of the population. Those are the people who I can't read the small print <laughs> from up here. But these are the people who are willing to pay more and who are scoring very high on those atti attitudes. And in my study, uh, they also elicit environmentally friendly activities, such as taking transit or riding your bicycle rather than driving. The activists are doing all of those things. Um, then we've got a group, the pragmatists. If it's convenient and I can do it at home, no problem, I'll, I'll be more sustainable. Then we've got a couple of groups that have got a lot of other things going on. Finally, we've got the disengaged denialist. Just don't even talk to me about it. So when you read in the newspaper, everybody, all consumers are excited about sustainability. They're all there. There are questions that can be asked that will get 80% agreement. We generally know that plastic is not good. But you've got to look at it a little bit more in a little bit more depth to understand who's at the leading edge and the other segments that are coming next and next. And each one of these segments is going to require different solutions. And brand, brand owners are starting to realize, well, they know there are segments and they've got to market different things to different segments. So I've seen one article, um, this was by Fisher, that took the question of, is plastic being replaced by paper? And what if it was? Um, how would the numbers look for the paper industry? And so they've done some estimates. If 10% of plastic beverage cups were replaced with paper cups globally, 
That would require a lot more cup stock, a 20% increase in the 2021 global capacity to produce cup stock. So if this happened overnight, that would be a big impact. If 5% of plastic packaging was replaced with paper, that would consume a lot of tons of paper, and the 12 million tons of increased capacity are mostly in Asia. So how would that impact us in Europe and North America? So the question is, how quickly will consumer behavior shift to renewable materials? Are there sufficient sustainably managed forests to support a rapid shift? What would be the role of alternative fibers? And if demand increased for pulp, for example, would pricing increase so much that it might affect the speed of that switch? So lots of questions, and we're just starting to get some data on these sort of at a, at a broad level. In this section, I've got some examples of uh, plastic replacing paper. So we'll just take a quick look at what brands are doing. So first of all, terminology, primary packaging is the packaging that contains the product. Secondary packaging is corrugated um, and other things. We'll take a quick look at that. Uh, the stuff that's used for shipping, protective packaging or dunnage is the filler that goes in the secondary packaging. So in this section, we're looking at primary packaging. So paper bottles are, we don't think they're available yet in the US. We've certainly looked. A lot of this is, is happening in Europe first, and it will eventually uh, reach the US. Now, paper bottles are not replacing plastic. In most cases, they're actually replacing glass. And it's mainly the spirits, but also in this case, Carlsberg beer. And uh, they've been working. We learned from a packaging engineer that Pepsi was working on paper bottles to replace plastic 10 years ago. And uh, Carlsberg started working on this in 2015, so they've been working on it for eight years. And they had a 1.0, this is their 2.0 bottle, which they, is actually on the market in, in Europe. They tested it in 2022, and it made it, it's now on the market. So it's got a wood fiber outer shell, a steel cap, and inside is a plant-based recyclable PEF, polyethylene, furinate. Um, and we've got a photo on the next page. They've got it to the point where they can bottle this beer on their regular packaging line, which was a great step forward so they didn't have to invest in new equipment. They are working on a recyclable paper closure that would be like that. And when they get their 3.0 version launched sometime next year, um, the result will be 80% less emissions than single-use glass bottles. And we've got a few more examples. This is um, absolute vodka. So the spirits producers are the main people pushing this. Obviously, there's a lot of, a lot of weight in glass. Um, absolute has increased the level of recyclable glass and reduced their bottle weight by 10%. This is a, and they're, the paper bottle is half the carbon footprint of the glass bottle. This is actually a British gin brand, but I put it up there so that you can see the plastic liner. And uh, this brand, Greenall, is reducing its carbon footprint by 84% by using a paper, paperboard bottle with a uh, food grade pouch inside. Consumers have to separate the pouch from the fiber. And one of the brands has a little peel strip that says, pull this up and it separates the two of them uh, quite readily. So a uh, big, big improvement in carbon footprint with this much lighter weight packaging. Now we've got Heinz started last year with the paper ketchup bottle. And this one is molded fiber on the outside, a sprayed food grade coating on the inside that will take oil or aqueous based products and this one is said to be curb, the intention is that it will be curbside recyclable when it is launched. We don't have a date for that yet. Uh, this one was launched in 2020. So this is uh, a molded fiber bowl for this frozen dinner. And ConAgra says this reduced uh, 50 to 70% decrease in the carbon footprint, that many metric tons, by in the manufacturing of the bowls when they switched from plastic. We've got a lot of paper bowl holders replacing, for beverages in particular, replacing plastic rings. And this was just launched. This is being test, tested in the Northeast 
by the Coca-Cola bottler uh, in New England and New York and New Jersey, and more, uh, Molson Coors is making a big investment to move all their beers from plastic rings to paperboard carriers. The entire North American portfolio by the end of 2025 expected to send one, say 1.7 million pounds of plastic annually. 75,000 pounds of packaging in the case of the Coke. Uh, we've got uh, tuna, anything that was multi-pack in plastic uh, can fairly readily be moved to paperboard. Uh, this was actually a pandemic impact. Uh, this fruit supplier and packer in Washington State realized that consumers didn't want to be picking over apples that are just displayed without packaging, you know, in a pile in the supermarket. So they came up with the idea of doing a paperboard box so that people could pick up their four apples without having to root through them. Um, I haven't seen that. I'm not sure if that's how widely uh, distributed that was. Just a couple more here. Candy is a big uh, category that's looking to replace with paper. I mean, I remember when candy and chips came in paper, and I also remember when those Smarties were stale because they were, had been sitting around for uh, a long time. But uh, Mars Wrigley has just launched these three uh, bars in paper. You can see by the size of the hand that it's a big enough bar that it might make it through the MRF. And uh, MRFs might be different in Australia. We're not, don't have all the details, but that's been launched and Mars FM in the US is certainly looking into this. Uh, Nestle has announced many of its brands going from plastic to paper. Uh, they first did it in Europe and this is actually, and then Canada last year uh, decided to um, go that route. Nestle is moving this out globally. Canada looked at what had been done in Europe and for regulatory reasons could not use the same package. So they had to start over and the Canadian package is described as a tough paper grade that's over lacquered on the outside with a water-based dispersion coating on the inside. And one more, laundry and personal care. Some of the European brands with uh, compostable pouches are putting them in boxes. And the child safety is the big issue. Now, when you get the plastic box in North America with the pouches, it's hard to get it open because of all the child safety stuff. But they figured out a way to do it with the box that's safe. So that's gonna save 6,500 tons of plastic per year. Procter & Gamble is bringing four of its largest shampoo brands out in shampoo bars, and that will reduce virgin plastic use by 300 million bottles annually. Oh, oh I've got one more. I just, there was a big write-up on uh, Hasbro. Hasbro has been working since 2010, you know, toys, a lot of plastic, both in the product and in the packaging. So they've been working on removing everything. First of all, they do recycle toys and make them into park benches, flower pots. Um, since 2010, taking, eliminating every part of the packaging that doesn't really need to be plastic. They're replacing the PET windows with just a picture of what's inside on the box. Uh, then they launched in 2020 Green Monopoly, which helps educate the players. Uh, property owners are encouraged to go gr to green up their properties. And uh, I haven't seen the game, but all the houses are wood and the tokens are made with PLA, uh, plant-derived plastic, and of course all the papers recycled. Uh, so Bill tells me that game boards have been made of recycled paper board for many years, or normally. Okay, so that was a look at primary packaging, and there really are a lot of changes starting to come through. Maybe not enough to measure it as a volume-wise yet. Let's take a quick look at e-commerce, and then we'll look at collection, and Bill will talk about paper packaging when he gets to the MRF, and finally to the mill. So the data just came out last week on e-commerce and total retail sales growth for 2022. And that was pretty surprising, but these are growth rates of e-commerce and growth rates of retail sales, excluding autos and bars and restaurants. 
And as you can see, commerce has been growing since 2010, or generally from the beginning, at about triple the rate of regular bricks and mortar. And that was consistent right up through 2019. 2020, e-commerce went through the roof. And uh, by retail sales went up because people were spending money on goods, not services. So people were still going out to the store. Now, retail sales shot up much higher than any growth rate for retail sales in 2021 as people started getting back into stores. And it's still up at 7.7 .7 in 2022 as people are still gradually getting back into stores. So that's still a pretty high growth rate relative to the history of retail growth going back a decade or two. Uh, E-commerce dropped down to its typical growth rate in 2021, and it's actually dropped more in 2022, and I would expect that this is e-commerce data translated by uh, this Digital Commerce 360. Sometimes they revise their numbers, that's possible, there might be a slight change, but my guess is that the recession, the prospect of recession is obviously is affecting people's spending. And as they're getting out fully into travel and restaurants, they're, sorry, restaurants aren't in here, but travel, their uh, shopping is, has dropped with e-commerce. They're spending less overall and they're still out there spending money on travel. So the e-commerce, has an impact on box shipments. And you can see a similar trend with box shipments up through 2019. Huge growth in 2020, again in 2021, 3.4% in one year, 2.3, a lot higher than what was the average from 2011 through 19. And then we've got a big drop this year, down 3.8%, which parallels that drop in e-commerce. And this is just our forecast uh, going out, which is for back to closer to his typical um, increases in rates of box growth. Now, the relationship between e-commerce and box shipments, corrugated box shipments. This is obviously an important sector for us in, in recycling um, and paper mills. And the story, the reason that it's important is initially brands would Back in 2010, going back to 2001, brands sent their products in the same packaging to be shipped with e-commerce. There were a lot of issues because packages historically have been designed to catch the shopper's eye in the store and a lot of them didn't make it very well through the shipping process. Traditional retail is five to six touch points between manufacturer and consumer as large loads you know, in one box are sent out to the retailer. There are 20 or 30 touch points with e-commerce as each shipment is broken down at another warehouse and goes on another truck. So e-commerce involves a lot more dropping, crushing, and damage. Return rates for in-store, 8 to 9% for e-commerce, 20 to 30%. Shipping dam damage is the major cause of returns, and 20% of e-commerce product returns are due to shipping damage. So e-commerce retailers learn to really over-package secondary packaging and because they don't want to lose customers. So shippers overbox, and as e-commerce has grown since 2010, overboxing was, was the norm. 50 to 70% of the space inside the box that gets dropped in your doorstep could be air or some kind of dunnage filler to protect the package, consumers started to be concerned about, as e-commerce increased, especially as we got to 2020, about the amount of stuff they had to dispose of. Uh, shippers strategies, there are four of them that reduce, so they started, especially in 2020, really working on ways to reduce the secondary packaging. Lightweighting is just using thinner, stronger, lighter versions, both for the product, this has been going on for decades, and for the secondary, the primary packaging and secondary. Right sizing is um, just being smarter about the number of box sizes you have in your warehouse. Fit to product technology produces a custom box that fits the product, and ship and own container is something that uh, Amazon initiated where 
and especially for large uh, items where it just ends up on your doorstep with minimal wrapping around it and you can see what the product is. So all of these things have contributed to reducing the secondary packaging and people in the box industry have questioned whether the amount of boxes used is going to go down and there'll be less recycled fiber available for mills. Here are some numbers from Amazon. Amazon's by far the biggest e-commerce shipper, although Walmart and Target and others are growing more rapidly at this point. Uh, at a conference we were at, Amazon said that between 2016 and 22, they, they reduced the number of products that went out of their warehouses in corrugated boxes from 73% to 36. So they started using a lot more mailers. As if you recall, they started using a lot more plastic mailers and consumers and environmental groups uh, started to notice. But they say between 16 and 19, they used 1.4 million fewer corrugated boxes. They reduced their packaging weights by 27% by using mailers and they increased the use of mailers from 27 to 47. Now, here are two slides on mailers. Bill mentioned mailers. Bill had a few of the, the ones that we're used to, not recyclable at all. Paper and plastic, not recyclable at all. Uh, we, this new uh, mailer with recycled fiber cushioning, sort of spongy white stuff in dots, came out about two years ago. Recyclable, but Bill questions whether the white fuzzy stuff inside would actually make it through the recycling process at the mill. He thinks it would go out in water uh, waste. Then we started to see craft, just thick craft paper envelopes, fully recyclable. And this is a new one that FedEx partnered with a, a packaging converter. And it's got corrugated mini flute inside it, which would give it a lot more cushioning than this one. So these two, no problem, well, these three, no problem uh, with recycling. And finally, we looked at Dunnage. We tried to get some numbers on. We have certainly observed that poly, uh, expanded polystyrene is much reduced coming into our household unless it came from Asia, in which case it's really low quality and it makes a mess in your kitchen. But these three, obviously not recyclable. Bubble wrap, plastic air pillows, not recyclable at curbside or drop-off, uh, even though people probably do take them in. Molded fibers had the fastest growth rate in North America uh, over the past five years. Definitely recyclable, not usually explicitly mentioned in recycling programs, but in our research with MRFs, very few MRFs have a problem taking it in. Then white newsprint and craft paper starting to be used more, we're seeing it more. Uh, corrugated can be used, but usually with larger uh, furniture type products or in lamps, things like that. Okay, so we're pretty sure that EPS has declined rapidly in North America and that molded fiber has increased greatly over the past five years. We still see bubble wrap plastic air pillows. We see a fair bit of this, but it would be certainly nice if we saw more of the paper and less of the plastic. So quickly, three slides on residential recycling. So consumers got the product with the primary packaging since they started ordering more online in 2020. They've got an awful lot more corrugated, typically in paper. This comes from the Consumer Brands Association, a survey that they did, and 92% of consumers feel that they know about their local recycling rules, but 40% of them admit they throw maybes into the recycling bin, and 4% say that they are not confused by recycling rules. So 96% of them are confused by recycling rules. Um, and anybody that you talk to who isn't in the business generally says, I have no idea. Uh, and Bill and I give people, we look at people's trash cans and try to give them advice on what should, should, should be in there. Um, and in the same study, uh, 
a substantial, over half of consumers said that plastic bags can be recycled at curbside and plastic straws can be recycled. The last, so what, is, what do recycling programs accept? The last study that was done by the Sustainable Packaging Coalition that included paper packaging was 2015-16. And 60%, so we've got paperboard, we've got beverage containers, corrugated. Most programs accept all of these, craft paper bags, pizza boxes, uh, down to those paper mailers, as long as they don't have plastic in them. Uh, molded fiber is usually not explicitly stated, but we know that MRFs don't mind taking it in. Aseptics just got upgraded to 60%. Uh, paper cups are starting to be accepted by more and more programs, but back when this research was done, they were accepted by less than 20%, along with food service packaging, and wrapping paper probably shouldn't be recycled. If we look at what is captured at curbside, the recycling partnership finds cardboard and uh, mixed paper to be up there, along with glass and HDP, HDPE of different sorts. At the bottom of the list is three to sevens, bulky plastics, aseptics, and cartons in there. Uh, this is based on a very large range of research, many cities, uh, and their measurement at curbside. We will let Bill pick this up here and talk about MRFs and MELs. Thanks, Susan. Good job. So, at the MRF, uh, uh, fiber packaging dominates uh, residential recycling. It makes up a big part of the volume and a big part of the uh, uh, economics and market value. And if we look at this uh, ring chart, we can see mixed paper uh, is the largest amount of material that comes out of residential at almost 40%, and, and corrugated second, strong second at 14%. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, you know, glass always comes in high because of I its weight. Uh, and then all, all the plastic resins we've broken out here. And if, if you do add them up, it's, uh, it's a substantial gro growth area. So. Corrugated and mixed make up 54% of the uh, material collected, followed by glass and various plastics. So when we look at paper packaging at the MRF itself, uh, again, 60% of the inboard is uh, inbound is, is paper-based materials. And among the uh, different grades, uh, OCC accounts for half of that material, uh, again, because of the growth in e-commerce, and mixed paper is another third. And Paper packaging is mostly found in number 54 mixed paper or the unofficial subgrade residential mixed paper. There's some number 56 uh, SRPN sorted residential paper news. Uh, uh, there are some MRFs out there that make this material. And actually the price differential between 56 and 54 has grown because there's so little newsprint uh, in the uh, recyclable stream now. And then we see a small amount of number 52 uh, aseptic cartons and, uh, and gable tops. So what's, what's needed at the MRF for successful material recovery? One is sufficient volume. You know, one of the things that's been a drag on the, the grade 52A septics and, uh, uh, and gable tops is it's a relatively small volume grade, 600, 650,000 tons of total production. You do the math with recovery and it's just not a big material. Uh, molded fiber. Uh, it's growing rapidly, but still relatively small volume. Uh, what I like to say about recycling is, uh, you know, if you have a small amount of really clean material, like a specialty converting scrap or something like that, and it's pretty clean, that's going to get recycled. If you have a large amount of material that's not so clean, like mixed paper, it's probably going to get re uh, recycled. The problem is when you have small amounts of material with contaminants and multi-layers, that's where the, the problem lies. So at, at the MRF, you have to have, uh, get it to flow through, and an, an example of a problematic flow through is paper packaging that keeps its three dimension tends to go on the container side. Aseptics, paper cups can wind up uh, in, the, in the plastic and, and the container lines and have to be picked out uh, and, and moved over to the paper sides. Uh, 
must, you know, of course, you must have a demand for the end market for the material in which uh, the grade is sorted. And the, uh, the new specification that I, I talked about that's being proposed for all white packaging and poly grades, uh, what, what occurred there was uh, the manufacturers of those products all put their heads together and said, you know, the ice cream tub people are this much, the cup people are this much, the uh, high-end SBS packaging is this much. If we put them all together, we'll get enough volume. And when you have enough volume, you get the mills interested in putting in the systems that are needed to, uh, to manage the materials. So what package types do the MRFs see or not see? And uh, the dark one is they don't see at all, and uh, the uh, lighter kind of is small amounts. And you can see uh, paper cups, uh, and th these are what we call a group of specialty packages. And you can see paper cups, uh, they, they really don't see them at all. Uh, and this, this data is a year plus old, so we're, we're seeing more of that. And, and going down to, you know, Pizza boxes, everybody sees pizza boxes uh, pretty much. And then small amounts, again, you can see uh, these upper packages are, are roughly in the same bo uh, ballpark. Uh, the paper mailers and pizza boxes, they don't think they're small amounts, they're, they're uh, somewhat larger amounts. So paper packaging that doesn't make it to the MRF. I mentioned the three-dimensional issue. Uh, and there's also the small size issue. You know, people looking at paper candy wrappers, are, are they really gonna make it through the MRF? Uh, pretty questionable. Uh, and paper in the container line often becomes residue and, and is disposed of. And one thing that's going on though is uh, there's a major amount of investment going into the MRF community to give us better systems to manage. And uh, you know, when I broke into the business, uh, if you had a million dollar MRF, that was a big MRF. I, I saw this week Rumpke announced the capital cost on their uh, Columbus Smurf is $90 million. Waste management over the next three years is going to spend, or WM Services is going to spend a billion dollars on MRFs. And the drivers are getting away from hand picking, doing it with screens, opticals. Some, we're seeing more robotics. Where labor's uh, expensive, we're, we're seeing more robotics. And it's aimed at reducing residue and producing cleaner streams. Uh, and uh, you know the MRF of 30 years ago was uh, 100 tons a day. Uh, a classical big MRF now is a, is 1,000 tons a day, and you can do a lot more when you have that kind of throughput. So when we look at uh, what is lost to residue, cartons, polylayers, and laminated stands out uh, as, as a, a real sore thumb. And again, I think with the new grade and with some attention played to this, this number will flip around. The other flip side is only a small amount of OCC is lost, the smallest boxes, and then everything in between, paper mailers, uh, up through uh, undeliverable mail, and uh, going up to food service packaging as being lost. And, and these, these are the, if you put these together, that's the new grade that's being proposed. And here's the, uh, the definition of the grade, if you haven't seen it. It was, uh, it was worked on for a couple of years, and it just, was uh, given to ISRI in, in January, so they, they have a process which looks at uh, uh, whether this re grade should really be established in commerce. An example of somebody who went, uh, the Carton Council went through that with grade 52, oh, I guess more like 15 years ago, and it really promoted that uh, separation of material when we had an established grade. Uh, a recent example was the self-adhesive label uh, folks uh, went to ISRI to get a spec for silicone release paper. You know, think of self-adhesive labels, the under paper is uh, silicone, uh, and it, it takes some special uh, care to recycle it. And uh, ISRI only gave them a, a, a specialty grade, because ISRI's specifications actually say the material has to be traded in commerce, and that grade was not traded in commerce, but neither was 52 when it was established. And of course, this grade is really not traded in commerce either. But you can see it, I call it the, you know, it's polycoated paper boards, SBS, paper cups, and actually has an allowance for uh, uh, some office papers too. So you can think of mail and office papers. And this is a, this is a tissue mill pack. And uh, it, on, on their own, again, any one of them is a relatively small volume, but if you put them all together, you start to get a volume that's uh, of interest to the tissue mills. And tissue mills, uh, feedstock being sorted off as papers with the decline in printing and writing papers, they've been hurting for furnish.
So this is some mill data, and uh, this actually comes courtesy of some work commissioned by AFMPA and is in their design guide. If you've never looked at the uh, AFMPA design guide for paper packaging, I encourage you to do it. It's on the, on the website. It's uh, got a lot of good details, and we're just going to point out a couple things uh, that are, are part of that. You know, OCC and corrugated, um, it's quite easily used by a, by a large amount of, of the mills out there. And they're, they're used by the uh, container board mills and the, the coated and uncoated recycled paper and board. You saw that uh, corrugated box uh, chart that Susan had up there. And, uh, you know, the, the previous peak in corrugated box production in the U.S. was 1998. And when China became manufacturer to the world, we had a steady decline for almost 20 years in corrugated box use. And it wasn't until e-commerce started to pick up in 2010 that things started to grow. And then we really had abnormal growth during the pandemic. And we're coming back now. But that was the China effect. The same thing's occurring in the coated recycle board. And CRB, or coated recycle board, is think of uh, cereal boxes, some food boxes, a, a widely used packaging grade. The pr pre prior to the rebuild of graphic packaging, or, or new machine of graphic packaging put into uh, Kalamazoo, the last machine that went in to make coated recycle board was in 1992. So we went you know, 30 years with, with declining capacity, and we probably shut down 20 CRB mills. And again, the, the manu when China became manufacturers to the world, they needed that primary packaging, and they built CRB mills. Well, when Graphic started up the new K1 machine last year, they were going to shut down two of their smaller CRB mills, uh, and uh, they didn't. They uh, only shut one because demand has been so good. And then, alas, this year, uh, or just recently in the last month, uh, they announced the first new uh, Greenfield CRB mill in the United States in maybe 40 or 50 years to be uh, in, in Waco, Texas. So the, the CRB business is good and growing. However, they are going to shut down some of their older capacity, but there is a, a capacity increase. And by the way, that uh, Waco mill is the only mill in the southwest that's being built. Lots of container board uh, going into the east and uh, an upper bin mess, uh, but nothing in California, and there was nothing in the uh, southwest until the graphic announcement. So if we go down the list, again, corrugated, widely accepted, CRB, URB. Kuk is, uh, is coated, uh, unco uh, is coated uh, natural craft. Think of beverage containers, beverage, uh, beverage carriers. Uh, there's a fair drop off there because they have a fair amount of uh, wet strength in it. And if you don't have pulping that's geared up to be able to use wet strength, uh, it can be problematic. Oops, let me go back. Craft paper bags, uh, molded fiber, and aseptics and gable tops, not, not the favorite material out there for the mills. So what paper packaging do the mills not want? And it's kind of a flip side of the, uh, of the previous one, but we look at some specialty packages here. And uh, the most acceptable to mo uh, mills are, are molded fiber. And you can put molded fiber in mixed paper, you can put molded fiber in corrugated, and, and you're gonna be okay. In a perfect world, you'd put the gray, uh, the gray molded fiber in mixed paper or news, news grades, and you put the brown protected packaging with OCC, and the white plates you'd put with, with that white grade or an SOP grade. Uh, Cups and frozen food boxes, there's some resistance, and it depends on the volume. Uh, the concern about food residue. And uh, the chart here is a percent no in the dark and percent depends in the lighter. So, you know, we had a lot of no's here. And again, this is not, uh, not mills that are, this, this is a, a host of a number of mills that participated in, in this survey. And you can see the depends. You get down to the molded fiber, and the depend there was really high. And this is the protective or, or, or brown material. And then when we did this, cups came in uh, kind of in the middle range. Uh, the paperboard packaging council, council says that 70% of frozen foods are recyclable and uh, in grades of uh, uncoated board without coating and wet strength. The least desirable, food residue, paper ice cream tubs, and, uh, and cartons. Am I doing this one? Okay. The Alphonse and Gaston Act here. <laughs> right. 
Okay, so from bad to worst, uh, uh, the worst is over here, cannot be present for most mills. And I'll start there, wet strength, metallized foils and finishes, I pointed out that, uh, that one here. Laminated foils and wax coating, these are, the, these are the real no's if you're in the packaging designing area. And I'll go over to the, the one that's readily acceptable, and you can see here the theme is water soluble, water soluble inks, water soluble dyes, uh, even e UVEB, which if you go back uh, a ways, UVEB was, uh, was just death. And, and besides being foil, this has UVEB in it too. These are uh, UV cured, electron beam cured coatings. Uh, they make a real pop for marketing, but most mills seem to be able to handle them now. They change their chemistry a bit to take that. And clay coatings, uh, typical in uh, CRB board, are acceptable. So then sometimes uh, a problem, but manageable are varnishes, poly coatings, PSAs, metal components, and bioplastics. I always wonder about bioplastics, which have a high positive viewpoint in the consumer world, but the plastic recyclers don't want it in their plastic, and the paper recyclers don't want it because it's a plastic. It's probably actually a little easier managed on the paper side. Uh, on the plastic side, uh, you, you can't pick it out. And then a challenge for many mills are plastic components, hot melts, poly window, and stamp foils. And again, uh, we, asked one, we asked a question at the end of the survey, uh, how, how should people design packaging to be reusable? And they said, make it all out of one material. Make it all out of fiber and we'll be happy. Uh, that, that seems to be a bit uh, utopian uh, philosophy. So, you know, how to increase the mill tolerance of packaging types. The, the mills are, are, are often split on, uh, on these issues. Some say outright no, uh, but there were a lot of things that were outright no, and then five years later they, they were perfectly acceptable. Uh, an, an example I always use is, is newsprint recycling. You know, the newsprint folks uh, uh, were brought into recycling, kicking and screaming a little bit. A bunch of uh, uh, states passed uh, recycled content laws which required them to do it. And we had about, in the 80s, we had about five recycle uh, newsprint systems uh, in the U.S. And by the late 90s, we had 30. And that's when newsprint started to decline. And one of the first things to go was recycle because it was more expensive. And the funny thing happened was, when the de-inking system started to be shut down, the newsprint paper maker said, hey, wait a second, you know, that stuff really gave us good opacity and uh, it was very valuable. So you, you see a change and UVEB at tissue mills was, was absolute no and 10 years later, that's fine because we have trouble getting enough white grade paper. So things change over time. And, uh, you know, packaging design uh, is, is definitely starting to kick in in terms of looking at what mills can use. And the mills are more open to new package types. Uh, uh, any new mill that goes in has a better stock prep and cleaning system stock prep is when you take the recovered paper and uh, clean it up and take the contaminants out and, and sort the fibers. And, and we're seeing big advances and a lot of uh, investment in stock preparation systems. Uh, it's very hard though to retrofit old mills, very expensive. But when you build new, you put the, you put the best stuff in. It's, it's like the MRF situation, uh, being very busy uh, in terms of equipment uh, that the uh, stock prep system is pretty big. And we're, we're seeing a real increase uh, uh, in mixed paper uh, for a couple reasons. One is uh, it's the last under, uh, bastion of under-recovered fiber. It tends to have more brown uh, corrugated in it, uh, than it than it ever had, and just makes it a, a much more attractive uh, uh, packed to, uh, to a board mill. So polycoated paperboard, um, we talked several times about cups here, um, and you know, cups is one of the, the larger users, but uh, uh, there are other substantial food containing uh, materials that come in polycoated paperboards. And you know, can mills really handle this? There was, these trials were actually done at uh, Graphic Packaging in Kalamazoo, and uh, they were very successful. They fed high quantities of, of poly-coated uh, uh, materials to uh, uh, get the result. And it had really no negative impact on the final product. And uh, it, it does depend on detrashing and color tolerance. And you know, food contamination and regulatory agency requirements need to be considered. Although, you know, if you, uh, 
a large percentage of mixed paper is still exported from the U.S. And there's some real jeopardy because there are many food contact uh, items in, uh, in mixed paper. And if you look in Southeast, if you look in Asia, you know, China was the first to ban <laughs> mixed paper, and then they banned all recovered papers. Four more countries are now banning imports of mixed paper. So the, uh, the export market for mixed paper is drying up. Uh, the pa MRF, MRF operators are very careful about what they ship in terms of mixed paper. But the good news is we have a, a, a very large amount of new capacity to make board uh, that will use mixed paper in the U.S. Kind of the short-term bad news is uh, the box business has, has cratered uh, uh, quite a bit. And uh, we have, we lost two million uh, tons of new box making capacity in the last, the last 18 months. And we've got two million tons of new capacity coming on. That's not a pretty sight. Uh, so I would look to uh, shake out higher, older cost machines. And this happens in the industry every five to seven to 10 years. It's a cyclical thing. Uh, demand looks real good. You build a mill. From the time you say, I want to build a mill, to when you get it up and running, three, four, five years. So pretty hard to predict what's going on. And what's being built now was kind of based on 2% box growth. And it looks like we're reverting to the mean of 1%. So we've seen one small container board machine shut down. But there will be more. Uh, it's going to be pretty painful, probably, for the next uh, 6 to 12 months in the corrugated box business. So looking ahead to innovation, you know, technological advances at, uh, at recycled paper mills are, are kind of more incremental. There's not a lot of earth-shaking uh, changes. It's more developmental. And again, there are many old stock prep systems in Asia and North America. You know, one of the reasons why China could use all of our mixed paper, and that, they were using mixed paper with 15, 20, 25 percent contaminants, they designed their mills to use that paper and manage the residuals. And if you do that, you can, you can do it. But you take an old uh, CRB mill, they can't handle mixed paper with 10% contaminants. They can't handle it with 5%. But the new mills are being built to handle 2 to 5%. And the MRFs, with all this investment, are trying to get down to the 2% level in terms of contaminants. So there are many old batch pulpers with old style detrashing that could be upgraded and continuous systems added. We've been looking at that on the West Coast. You know, there's no. Uh, Except for NORPAC in the Pacific Northwest, there's virtually no capacity to use mixed paper in the Western U.S. And those exports, and it's all going export, and that's, there's a jeopardy there in terms of uh, food contact and, and other materials in it. So the question is, you know, what, how can we incentivize the existing mills to spend the money to improve stock preps? Uh, because it'll, it'll have pay off in the long term. But we're talking about, you know, it's not trivial uh, investments. These are 10 to $50 million investments at any given mill. But we're, we're seeing some retrofits uh, on existing mills, and, uh, uh, and, and many new, almost all the new mills can handle mixed paper with the capability of wide-range uh, fiber packaging. The new Waco mill is really going to have an advanced stock prep system to handle all kinds of packages. And there is a lot of opportunity for yield improvement and energy savings. And, then, you know, will we ever see a more sophisticated system for measuring quality of recovered paper? Uh, I like to say that uh, the, the way we measure quality of recovered paper, it's uh, ocular technology. You know, I kind of look at the bale and uh, I, I, I know what I see there. You know, if it's really bad, I'll break it open. Uh, but the operators get used to seeing certain material and certain suppliers, and that's what it's... Uh, that's what's used. In Europe, they actually have a fair uh, amount more sophistication in terms of measurement. Uh, they do a lot of uh, uh, total shipment uh, moisture using, uh, using uh, infrared type approaches. And they, there's some UV approaches looking at other contaminants. So suggestions for the uh, paper packaging manufacturers, what the, what the brand owners should do is do not combine fiber packaging with any other material. Avoid film, shrink wrap, coating, embossing. Use a single layer, not multi-layer. Use paper labels. It, it all comes down to, hey, if you only made these things out of all fiber, we'd be real happy. Uh, and, and, and we're sort of moving that way uh, in terms of uh, design guides out of AF and PA. And it takes a long time to get packaging through the system. If you decide today, I'm going to change my packaging on a, on a product, 
you're probably looking at two years and maybe three years before that actually gets into commerce. You gotta design new machinery, you gotta have testing, you got FDA, uh, there's a regulatory process and uh, a fair amount of uh, uh, changes to packaging uh, equipment, uh, which is highly sophisticated. So, we thank you for your attention. We, we didn't get a lot of questions during the time frame. I may have asked some questions to the audience, but we'll throw it up for questions uh, to uh, see if, uh, if you have anything. We may get you out to the reception early. By the way, uh, if you would like a copy <laughs> of the presentation, email Susan. But Michael, we know you're going to ask for it. So, and Brian asked already, so he he beat you to it. <laughs> any any questions? Got a microphone on the audience. Okay, well we'll stick around for a few minutes if you want to come up and ask us anything uh, uh, in in person. But appreciate your attending and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.